All right, great. So, hi everyone. Welcome hi. to our official District 5 April meeting. This is so exciting. Um, I'm sure we'll have more folks joining us as we go along, but as per usual, Shalini and I got very excited about all of the things that we're working on, and um, I made a slideshow for you. So uh, we're going to move through some of the uh, some of the poor Shalini. I'm like, I'm going to make a slideshow. She's like, can I look at it? I was like, <laughs> if I do it in enough time in advance. <laughs> so she had about five minutes to look at it. So um, I'm going to. And you had two minutes to add my slides. Fine. Um, all right. So before we get started, though, I do actually think folks on this call do know each other because, like you said, it's mostly a. Um, <laughs> yes, sorry, we, it's we a, do. The most engaged uh, Amherst folks, which is great. So um, <laughs> I have met all of you at this point to, to reiterate for the sake of the recording, maybe my name is Anna Devlin Gothier. I'm one of your district five counselors. I use she, her pronouns. Uh, and I'm actually coming to you from downtown right now. I'm, I'm at work still. So uh, that's why this, this is not my house. <laughs> uh, my house does not look this professional. So uh, Shalini, I will toss it to you. All right, and I'm Shalini behild -Milm. I'm the other District 5 counselor, and I'm speaking from my home office, which I love. It's in my basement. Welcome, y'all. Thank you so much for coming, everybody. So here we go. Do -do -do, do -do -do -do. All right. Um, so just to run you through what we're doing today, uh, we've got a lot on our agenda. Um, so we want to talk through what we've wrapped up since the last time that we came together in March. We're going to talk through what we're working on both at the council level, but then also in the committees that Shalini and I are on. Um, we will talk through, there was a really interesting discussion at the town services and outreach committee. Shalini and I both sit on that committee about paving and road repair. So we wanted to give you a little bit of an overview on that, as well as a couple other things that Shalini is, has going on in CRC. Um, I'm going to give a really quick overview of what the fiscal year 23 budget process looks like. Uh, quick updates on what's happening around town. Mindy is going to give an update on what's going on at the State House. We'll talk through some current openings that are on committees that we really would love to fill with some wonderful District 5 people. Uh, and then we will open it up for comments, questions, just general open floor. So blazing through here, what we have wrapped up. Um, Shalini, I don't have my little divvying up of what we're doing. In, so just stop me mm -hmm. if I start talking about something you're supposed to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, so Shalini is going to go into depth on the paving discussion in a moment, but we did have that conversation at TSO. Uh, we finalized parking permit fee changes. So essentially, I think we talked about this last time, our parking permit fees, that's for folks who live really close to downtown. They can purchase a parking permit to park closer to where they live, and especially if they live in an apartment or don't have um, parking available. And those fees hadn't been updated in many, many, many years. They were, I believe, Shalini, correct me if, if I'm off, they were, I think, somewhere around the lines of like $30 a year, um, something very, very low. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so um, that's, that's too low, unfortunately. So we did need to raise them. One of the things that we did when we raised them, though, was saying that this needs to be reevaluated annually um, versus waiting another 10 years or longer. Um, so that we don't need to make big jumps. And we are also escalating the, the prices slowly so that it's not overwhelming both to our town staff, who are the ones who have to feel the calls when people are angry that the prices go up, but also so that, that it's not a shock to um, folks who are purchasing these permits. It is now much closer to what UMass, Northampton, other surrounding towns charge for their similar parking permits. There's a, we approved a new crosswalk going from basically across from Garcia's, that area, over to the playground at Kendrick Park, um, as well as parking changes and a bike lane on the, is that Kendrick Park? Is that, yeah, the street that's on the other side of, of um, Kendrick Park as well, to make sure that people have a place to park when they go to the playground. I don't know if anyone else has noticed this. That playground is never empty. Um, it's pretty amazing. I walk my dog down there a lot because I work in town and um, constantly seeing people playing there is, is really, really sweet. Uh, GOL, our governance committee, has made some updates to the rules of procedure. As we learn, as we you know fly the plane as we're building it, we are constantly learning more efficient ways to do things. And GOL has been focusing on how do we adapt our rules of procedure to make sure that they are equitable, to make sure that they are 
um, matching what we need to get done. I couldn't remember if we talked about this last time, but I wanted to make sure it was mentioned. We finalized our, or approved our Community Preservation Act fund allocations for next year, um, which is really exciting. For those of you, I, I think all of you know this, but I'm just gonna remind you, CPA is a, an incredible community resource. It supports things like affordable housing. It supports um, recreation, conservation, uh, and open space and historic preservation. So a lot of these really important projects um, have, have been supported by CPA funds. For example, the new, uh, the new affordable development that Wayfinders will be building on Belchertown Road um, is, it was, that land was purchased with CPA funds. So it does help, really helps our community in, in important ways. We did a poll hearing for the South Landfill. I included that just to let you know that that project is, is cruising along. Um, and for those who know folks in Amherst Woods um, and have not heard this, the fencing is going to be going up around the North Landfill. Uh, so the dog park is in the front part on Belchertown Road. They're keeping the sledding hill open, but they're fencing in the rest of it as protected habitat for the grasshopper sparrow. So, Mindy, you look like you're thinking geographically. So, do you, <laughs> yeah. Um, but basically, that's that was part of the agreement. It's um, it's going to be under conservation restriction, and uh, that's to limit. These are ground nesting birds, so it limits dogs going into um, free range and trample on the nests. Can I ask a question? Sorry. Uh, yeah. What is a, what is poll hearing? Is a good question. So town council is the keeper of the public way. So anytime that a telephone poll that's it considered in the public oh. way needs to change, they have to come to us and ask us. So it's so literally, 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 a poll. literally a, a poll. Okay. Yeah. I asked that question about three times before <laughs> I fully wrapped my head around that. Yeah. <laughs> Mindy. So Mike, uh, thank you, Anna. My question is about... Um, the landfill and the fencing. So there's like a path that runs parallel to the sledding hill and the landfill that leads up to where the landfill starts and also the dog park. Is that going to be fenced off or that, I think it's part of the Robert Frost Trail. Robert Frost Trail is around the outside that will stay available. Thank you. Yep. Um, so just, you know, Mindy, you might hear some things from your folks about it too, because it's, um, it's a I'm little- hear about it. I'm probably going to hear about it from my husband, actually. You might. Because <laughs> <laughs> he walks our dog in the landfill like every day. Yeah. So that's yeah. okay. I'll be prepared. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you can send them to us. We'll deal with it. Um, so then we've also passed a variety of proclamations. For those who don't know, just to throw this out there, residents can always bring forward proclamations for the council to pass. So- um, we do uh, proclamations or, or citations. We have not taken advantage of the citation component, and I'm going to try to encourage us to do that soon. But essentially, those are congratulatory um, statements from the council. We also pass resolutions, which are non-binding, um, but these can be brought forward by our community members. They do not need to originate in the council. Um, and so when you bring them forward, we uh, try to find a council sponsor for them to move them through the process. So a few that we have done, um, Today, we did a reading, it's Holocaust Remembrance Day, and so we also did the reading for Jewish American Heritage Month. Um, prior to that, we've done Juneteenth. Shalini, do you want to talk about Arbor Month? Because you were the sponsor for that. Yes, I was. And that was April is the Arbor Month. And uh, I would encourage everyone to uh, avail of the free, which you all probably know, someone here knows about this more than I do. but. Um, the tree commission or whoever gives out free saplings and trees. So, um, yes. I believe it's on, uh, I believe it's at the farmer's market. Um, if not at the celebration on Sunday, I, or no, that's, that's also Saturday. Mm -hmm. My weekend days are, are flip-flopping. I'm telling you, um, but there is an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And then the other one is there was a tree sale happening from the, um, environmental science club at the high school a while ago. So I am going to be the proud new owner of like eight new trees and I don't know where I'm gonna put them, but uh, there's a lot of opportunities to get low or free cost saplings. Um, yeah. Hey Lynn, we have the president of Hi Council. Lynn. Welcome. Um, and then one of the other things that uh, we finalized was redistricting. So uh, this is your friendly reminder. You should have gotten something in the mail just to confirm your polling place. 
Um, the mailing, I believe, was labeled as town census. So please um, check that, confirm. I, for all of you, most of you, I don't think your polling place changed. Although, Adrian, do are you still with us after the change? I can't remember. You're in. Di you're being. No, uh, I, was say, I feel like you might be leaving us. I hope you keep coming. I back. am moving to District Three. three. So, yeah. Um, I'm. I'll always be part of South Amherst, regardless yes. of the. <laughs> my my home base. Mm -hmm. I think tra transitions are always a good opportunity to interconnect and to stay connected as a community. Even though I will be, we we will be leaving you here in. Pre, the old precinct seven. Mm. Yeah. To and it's important to note we are still your counselors through the next election. So um, that is that is that is still you're you're stuck with us. You lucky duck. <laughs> um, all right, Shalini, anything to add on this, or should I continue? Um, not in this. But are we? Does the agenda have the water and sewer changes and all of those? Yeah, things? that's the committee. I'm gonna. Okay, we're gonna go into that. Okay. So, so th this is kind uh -huh. of what we're currently okay. and upcoming down the road, right? So the big one that's not on here because I know you know it is budget. Um, we're launching full on into budget season. Um, mm -hmm. But two of the things that are currently in town services and outreach, where Shalini and I also both sit, are water regulations and sewer regulations. Shalini, do you want to start talking because I know you are excited about the public engagement. Um, possible or yeah do you want to start us off with that with the water and sewer yeah or I can't doesn't matter yeah I know um, I think it's an important one because there's a confusion about who pays when there is a break in the water especially the water line uh, and if the break is at the street level or if the break is um, in your home and uh, so right now the way it stands uh, the resident the house homeowner pays for it even though the break breakage happened at the street and because of a street paving or uh, because their tree is growing. I spoke to one resident downtown and they said they have to change their, they have to clear out their sewers and uh, every three or four years because the tree roots go and impact. And those are town trees, so you can't touch the town trees. And it's the homeowner who has to pay for it um, and there are a few towns who, where the towns pay for um, any kind of breakage like that. So it's really a discussion uh, at the level of the town council and our committees right now. The TSO is talking and discussing it, um, what, who should be paying and when. And one other option that we're studying is where the town takes out an insurance um, to cover that. And so homeowners will be responsible, but they can take out that insurance. And the other piece that's really becoming uh, very important is that many people don't know that they are responsible for that. So it comes as a big shock if suddenly you get a bill of $15,000 because your um, um, you know, pipe was damaged because of some street work and people don't know that. So there are different components to this conversation and we just want everyone to know about it and be part of it. And Martha has a hand up and then Adrian. Uh, uh, yes, so I'll add my two cents in, in there that yeah. uh, since you were both, you know, our counselors, I uh, would urge you to vote for the, what is it, the option two that our DPW had uh, presented where the town would pay for uh, damage in the water mains that's under the street, you know, from the mm -hmm. you know, trunk line to your curb. Because after all, you know, as you just mentioned with the person that had the town tree, I mean, mm -hmm. we have no control over what's happening on the street, whether heavy trucks are going over, whether something got dug up, how old mm -hmm. the pipes are or anything. And so it doesn't seem right that the homeowner should have to pay thousands of dollars like this lady that has mm -hmm. this $18,000 bill. Now I know in my particular case, I had uh, a leak in the uh, water system. It was at the time that the sewers were putting in in our street. So the road was kind of torn up anyway, but at first we thought that the leak was, you know, on the part of the pipe under the street. And so I had the, uh, 
you know, the contractor that I was paying then dug up and discovered, no, it wasn't that pipe. It was actually uh, several feet in on my property, which was fine. But then the street, then the town wanted to charge me for repaving the street when they were going to have to repave it anyway, because they were putting in the sewer. Oh. And I was able to argue them out of that, but that's just an example of, you know, it doesn't seem right that the homeowner should pay for what's going on with the street and right under the street. So that I would, I would urge you to, to vote for that option. I agree. Thank you, Martha. So um, may I jump in as well? Please. Yes, please, Adrian, go ahead. Thank, thank you, Martha. I, I support your point of view. And if my, if I may add, um, here in Orchard Valley, our homes are 60 years old. And when, when we ha moved into this development, the town in, in its wisdom planted these wonderful trees. And for homeowners like me, um, I have done maintenance on having a Roto-Rooter come in annually to make certain that the tree roots were not interfering and um, damaging and uh, leaking in, if you will, into these old sewer pipes. It is costly to the homeowners, but I, I want to I wanna footnote a couple of things, perhaps that the counselors, Anna, at you and Shalini can take forward. Um, I think the cost to be borne by the homeowner, an unknowing homeowner, is um, unnecessary, but I think the town can do the following. One, notify homeowners of the existing uh, statute right now on record and the fact that the maintenance to keep sewer lines open is is incumbent upon the homeowner and encourage homeowners to do that to keep roots from uh, eroding already old pipes going into the sewers into the streets and third to keep us apprised of the the encumbrance of the homeowner because I know the the woman who was charged eighteen thousand dollars for most of us, um, that's exorbitant, and to be forewarned is to be forearmed. So one, we need information about the maintenance that's incumbent upon each and every homeowner, including yes, maintenance of Rota Rooter that's on our dime. But what's the town's responsibility to those of us who are in these um, older? Uh, developments where you know the the sewers and the pipelines are getting pretty old so thank you for listening no thank you that's a really good really good point alice i'm interested in that because i lived almost across the street from adrian and uh never did anything with rotor rooters <laughs> or anything never had any problems of that kind we had heavy i mean we all have heavy clay soil I don't live there anymore, of course, but um, and, and I wonder whether the heavy clay soil had something to do with this, but also the, the trees that were planted by the town did not survive, partly because it was such heavy clay soil. So we did put in other trees, which, which managed to survive, partly because we knew more about how to plant them. Anyway, that's my, my take on it, that I didn't ever know anything about rotorooters and problems with roots getting into, into um, sewer lines. Yeah, Martha? I might need to unmute yourself. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to add one, one more point. I know when the council was talking about the issue, uh, I think it was mm -hmm. Dorothy Pam that uh, mentioned that in most cases, the homeowner's insurance policy will pay for it. Well, so in my case, the homeowner's insurance policy did pay it, but, uh, you know, with some deductible, but my mm -hmm. insurance agent warned me that if I had another insurance claim on the house in the next three years, the mm -hmm. company would very likely cancel my home insurance, period. Wow. And mm -hmm. so the means that just saying, oh, well, your insurance pays for it, um, is right. still leaves a, a real risk on the homeowners. So I just would like yeah. that to be taken into account. Thank you. Okay. 
So yeah. Just, so, oh, please. Yeah, go ahead, Anna. No, I was going to move on. So go ahead. I was just going to say, I just want to throw it out there that, you know, we have like, we're going to go to pavements next and you'll see that we have so many costs. And so just taking on additional costs means we are um, taking out, taking it out from somewhere else. And so um, I don't know what I, where I was going with that, but just that to be cognizant that with education and with getting a town insurance which might be cheaper than a regular insurance would that be a good and like if everyone was warned and educated and they had the insurance would that be a sufficient i'm just we haven't decided but i'm just getting ideas would that be sufficient asked, it's all in educating the citizenry shalini i think the town given our real estate taxes and the awareness that the cost to the town might be absolutely un, uh, uh, impossible and astronomical. Mm -hmm. I think the homeowners, we just need to know what is our responsibility and what do we need to do to avert any, uh, any issues mm -hmm. regarding 18,000. The other thing that I thought of, and I'll be brief because I know you want to move on. Mm -hmm. Isn't there a way for the DPW to alert a homeowner where the water usage goes beyond? In other words, the, the water coming out of each residence, we are accustomed to knowing what our monthly water uh, uh, bills are. However, mm -hmm. if there is a leak and a homeowner is not aware of the mm -hmm. uh, extra cubic uh, feet that are used, perhaps there could be a tripwire at the DPW alerting the homeowner so that before we get into 18,000 of not only water waste and water usage, but the cost of replacing the lines, surely there's, there's some way of assisting us as we try to avert an encumbrance of mm. the town in in taking on costs of eighteen thousand for every homeowner that has this this huge bill right and and the question was around the insurance last thing and then just just a quick feel how do you feel about a town-based insurance uh as an option can i say something before we do the group yeah. feel really quick so because on this yeah. topic so yeah. what we've asked guilford mooring and and amy Brasecki to come back with which are they're the director or superintendent and assistant superintendent of DPW, we've asked them to come back with cost comparisons because if we do switch over to the method where the town owns up to the property line or up to the curb, right, they, what they have said is that it, it would allow them to shift to being a pro in a proactive, uh, acting in a proactive manner. Instead of just replying, just responding to broken water mains, they could get on a schedule of going around in a different way. So there are a lot of other considerations, right, that go into the town taking ownership of that. But one, one big factor is cost. We know that, right? And so we've asked them to come back with what would it cost, you know, per household or, or et cetera. What are the potential costs for up to the property line, for up to the of actual house, like up to, up to the um, break, not break, it's not a breaker when it's water, but, you know, mm -hmm. up to the house. Mm -hmm. um, and then mm -hmm. up and then no change and then an insurance policy. So we will be looking into that cost very closely. Mm -hmm. Good. Sorry, you can do your question, Ashani. No, no, let's move on. I think you summarized it well. Okay, so a um, couple other things. Oh, did you wanna talk about the general discussion we had with Amherst Media? Um, well, is everyone here aware of um, the situation you no. can do you want to yes yes I can, I can do a brief yeah one. do a brief one yeah, yeah. sure so essentially amherst media as y'all as you all know is a local wonderful local nonprofit. um they provide a major service for the town by streaming uh or broadcasting our meetings planning board finance committee um i think i think those are the big three school and school oh, and school committee yeah. thank you mm -hmm. so um they are in a situation where they're in the process of building a new building that will house all of their everything. Um, but the building they're currently in, which is down on College Street, uh, that building that's covered in Ivy, they're uh, getting asked to vacate by Eversource who owns that building. 
So it's been a little bit of a challenge because their new building is not ready to find them a space for approximately two years, two to three years. Um, we do not, we don't have town buildings available, unfortunately. And I know that we have a number of vacant buildings, but they are not suitable for uh, occupancy at this point um, or are slated, slated for other use. So we had a discussion around that, but also around what are the communication practices between Amherst Media and the town. Um, we used to have a town representative sitting on their board. We talked about what would it look like to reinstate that, et cetera. Um, so that's, that's the really brief overview. We, the council doesn't necessarily have a decision to make in this. We were trying to foster some better communication and to get a really good understanding of what the situation is. What the council can do is talk to Paul about how to prioritize this. Yeah, Nancy. Uh, yeah, not directly related to Amherst Media, although unless they wanted to extend their role, but is the town looking at all into town-wide internet service? Both South Hadley and Greenfield have now done this and it has been, from what I've heard, very successful in both towns. And it would seem to me, it's too bad that Amherst couldn't have been a, a leader in that process. Yeah, um, you know, I don't know if Lynn has Lynn, more of yeah. an on this or not, or, and I know that there would probably, mm -hmm. uh, I believe that there was big efforts, maybe I'm wrong uh, on the part of Greenfield. I don't know about Hadley to get funding for that. Um, Lynn, do you have any idea on municipal fiber? or just municipal wireless? And then maybe Adrian has an answer or another comment. Uh, if there have been discussions from time to time and um, in the process, it would basically mean we would become a utility and there are that have become utilities uh, companies. I mean, for example, um, Holyoke has a water utility and it's one of the reasons that they're um, water rates are really, really low is because they basically use the river as their generation for water. And actually it attracts industry because it's so low. If we were going to take on putting in townwide internet, we would become a utility. We'd have to create a mm. utility, have to um, basically put it in. And so it wouldn't, it wouldn't be free per se, particularly as it directs directly connects to houses. Um, it's not a live conversation at this time. I'm not saying it's not ever gonna come back, but as far as I know, it's not a live conversation at this point. Nancy, yeah, it's slightly alive in the back of my brain. Um, other things have taken priority, but it was something that I was interested in pursuing yeah. prior. So it's not, um, it hasn't, I have not been able to dedicate time to it yet, but know that it is on people's minds. Because you're right, it would be a, it would be a major asset to the town. It would be a significant undertaking, but it would be a major asset. Yeah. Adrian. So, okay, so um, <laughs> there are a couple of threads here. Let me see if I can stick to at least uh, just mm -hmm. two of them. Um, I I heard the entire town council discussion regarding Amherst Media on Monday night, and I was hopping around in my seat because I happen to have been the last and only the second liaison uh, mm -hmm. of the town to the Amherst, to Amherst Media and sitting on their board for a couple of years and also participated in the Cable Advisory Committee. So I think I know some of the internal issues both from the town's perspective as well as the Amherst Media perspective. I'm not going to go into that right now, but I would like to hit on two things. Uh, one is that I agree with Anna. Anna, I think we've been calling for broadband, for the town to go into broadband since our Cable Advisory Commission um, decided that we need to needed to disband disband but asking that another cable advisory committee be created we felt our role had ended but we didn't say that it should disband part of the issues and it's in the minutes and unless i'm absolutely wrong we ask for the town to continue looking into the whole issue of the partnership between the town of amherst 
and Amherst Media, given the changing um, internet aspects, streaming, people cutting cords, the fact that the town is now into its own internal INET, that was a three-year um, mega really a mega uh, agreement between the town and cable and the um yes the, uh, the the cable company comcast to allow the town to take over its own inet but that's because comcast wanted out of the business anyway it, it's it's very complicated i don't want to go into the weeds but one i think going forward Amherst Media in the town absolutely must be clear what its next couple of years is going to be as a partnership. And secondly, I hope the town continues, Anna, if you're supporting this, to look into broadband for the town to have its own independent, as East Hampton and many of the towns in Massachusetts has done. I think you'll find Amherst Media, at least the former board, I no longer serve on that board, as supporting that position. So um, that's all I have to say on that. Yeah, thank you, Adrian. Lynn? Yeah, interestingly enough, and Adrian, I did know that you served on the board uh, for the town, and I'm sorry, I wish, I frankly wish you were still there. Um, the, uh, but thank you for doing that. The actual, the cable commission um, has to be re-engaged, uh, re if you will, reappointed. Uh, it's an every 10 year cycle, but in order to get ready for the um, 10 year renewal of any license or the 10 year decisions about any license, you basically start 36 months in advance. And so sometime toward the end of 2022, going into 2023, by the fall of 2023, we need to have that cable commission um, up and running again because they need to do a community survey. I mean, Adrian, you know this better than I do. Um, they need to do a community survey and so forth. This would be the time, exactly. This would be the time in order to decide, to look at whether or not um, we're going to move into a townwide broadband, and it would also um, be the time to look at, frankly, what's happening with cable television around the country and the world, because the, with live streaming, it's not what it used to be, and it's, um, and I think the most important thing is to determine is it a service that we need to have in Amherst the way we presently have it in order to be able to reach all of our residents? Or frankly, is internet providing that service? So it's a much bigger question. Right now, yeah. the immediate question for Amherst Media, uh, which to be honest, yeah, the, they are responsible for finding their own space based on the contract with the town. Um, but the immediate question for Amherst Media is where are they going to go at the end of June? And um, they had approached a variety of the, the entire council and then individual councilors. And that led to the discussion uh, at the council meeting uh, that you were, um, Adrian, thanks, thank you for listening to it. Um, and at some point, it would be useful to hear more of your perspective on it. But uh, the history, the uh, future of cable television, I think, is a question mark. And in terms of what it is and what it looks like and whether or not at the time we go into the cable uh, commission again is the time to be looking at whether we also now institute uh, an Internet service that's provided by the town. I see some shaking heads, Nancy. You've been there before. Adrian, you've been there before. Adrian, Good time. Get to it. Yep. All right, Lana, we can talk about it. I guess I will I will bump that to the top. Adrian, did you have something to add? Just very quickly, Lynn, um, I urge you, I urge you on behalf of, of everyone involved to make certain that the Cable Advisory Committee or whatever it's in its new iteration will be, to be up and running in the fall of 2022. 
we we were called into action only 12 months before this is a far and it, it it's an un, un the task itself is not possible given the very changing timeline so with that having been said lynn i look forward to having that cable advisory committee up and running and um for the for the foreseeable future because it is such a quickly changing um wife out there uh that is terrific advice and coming from somebody like you coming from you with the experience you had on the last one i i greatly value that advice thank you all right well we have marching orders now i, yeah, I love you. this is such a good group we have such a good district um all right so can we, can we just uh, do the public service announcement on behalf of ms media that they're looking for 2000 square feet of space for two to three years if anyone has contacts with umass hampshire college hitchcock center anyone who might have space for them and like yeah. an old you know huge huge barn or something that's just hanging out <laughs> yeah but there's uh, there's uh, equipment and stuff so they will they want to make sure that it's safe and and that and so forth but yeah a huge but, very safe one huge safe yes yeah. exactly yeah. exactly um so right. in addition oh adrian did you have something else to add no okay great um so but a blaze through the last couple of things um flood maps we are we are going to get these done very soon <laughs> right lynn um yeah, so I think I think Lynn's gonna like start ripping up agendas if we don't get it done soon. So uh, flood maps have been before the council for a very, very long time. It just is a long process. They are 10 year flood maps, right? So they're really important. Um, and those maps are able to be viewed. Ooh, Shani or Lynn, do you remember exactly how people can view them if they're interested? Otherwise I can, I believe it's on the planning. You'll, Lynn will find it. I'll find it. Lynn will find it. Okay, okay. so um, other things. Shalini is going to talk about in a moment the rental registration bylaw. That's something that the Community Resources Committee is working on. Um, I introduced a bylaw on Monday. I was very proud of it. I um, introduced my first bylaw. So uh, this is uh, to ban deceptive advertising on the part of limited services pregnancy crisis centers. So these are centers that um, pose as uh, clinics for, for folks who are pregnant. Um, but they are often evangelical in nature and seeking to talk people out of getting an abortion. So they don't actually provide true medical services. Um, and so they tend to fly under our state deceptive advertising bylaw because they're not selling products. Um, and so some local municipalities have started to introduce, um, Mindy is more complicated than that, but that's the very general <laughs> reason. Um, they've started to introduce uh, different municipalities have introduced bylaws similar to this. It does not ban those centers from existing. It merely says you cannot falsely advertise in print or online about what you do. Mindy. Um, could you describe for us, first of all, thank you, Anna, so much for introducing this bylaw um, because a lot of pregnant people go to these clinics throughout the Commonwealth and the country thinking they're going to get counseling on a range of options and usually end up getting steered away from some or not even being provided with options, just being provided with one path. Um, so I, as a resident and as a constituent, I wanna thank you. Um, but I'm also wondering if you could explain to us what is the process of that bylaw? When does it get voted on and how can we help? Yeah, thank you. So um, the process, it was, I introduced it on Monday and it was referred to GOL, our governance um, organization and legislation committee. Uh, they will be pursuing a legal review just to make sure it's sound. Um, I'm confident in it. This is not the first time this bylaw has passed and I think it's a pretty good one, um, but it needs to go through legal review. Once that comes back, GOL will actually be reviewing this for substance. So typically, GOL just looks to see if something is clear, consistent, and actionable. On this one, they're actually going to dig into it and talk about the, the content. Um, they will recommend it or not recommend it back to council, um, and then the council will have to do two readings. So um, the best way to support it would be to engage in public comment. Um, so either writing a public comment to the town council or calling into one of the meetings once it comes closer. My anticipated timeline, if everything goes according to my plan in my head, is that it'll come before the council in uh, early June. That's my current thought. Um, 
that depends on how much of a beast this budget turns into, but we're, that's my current hope right now. Um, but public comment is, is very, very welcome. Thank you. I hope you keep us um, in the e-news posted as to its progress so we can- I will. I will write a darn newsletter if it's the last thing I do, I swear. <laughs> I even started one. All right, so um, yes, I will. Thank you, thank you. Um, uh, also of note with that particular bylaw is I uh, got really excited and wrote ours really fast, but East Hampton and North Hampton are also planning to introduce similar um, similar bylaws in, in their cities. So keep an eye on this. This is something that this is not as much of a huge risk in Amherst because these centers typically target lower income uh, communities, communities that have higher percentage of people of color. Um, and so they tend not to target communities like Amherst. However, that does not mean they do not advertise here. And us passing it, East Hampton passing it, Northampton passing it, supports communities that are targeted in saying, hey, look, we can use their bylaws that have passed legal muster that have stood up and gotten voted on. Um, we're, we're kind of that rising tide lifts all boats thing, right? So we're trying to, to think of this as it supports Amherst and it supports this, this larger, our larger community as well. Uh, and then the last thing, uh, I'll, I can let Shawnee talk about it, but that's in CRC as well, which is the demolition delay bylaw. Um, that's looking at, Sh oh, Shawnee, I'll let you go, sorry. I, I was on her, I was just oh. going. You can keep going. I Okay, um, so basically what this is, is um, we currently do have a demolition delay bylaw, but this is about a pause be before a structure that is determined to be historic can be partially or fully demolished. Um, and so the prior bylaw, I believe Sean, I jump in if I'm incorrect, but the prior bylaw was very, very, very broad and um, kind of ambiguous. And so they're trying to be very clear about what is a historic structure, who, who determines what a historic structure is, um, how long do people have to wait, what counts as demolition, all of those questions CRC is wrestling with right now. Uh, and so that will be coming back to the council at some point. At yeah, some point. So the CRC voted 5-0 to move it forward, recommending the changes. I think the big change is also moving it from the zoning bylaw to a general bylaw. And that's because uh, other towns do that, and that's what's recommended by um, the higher state level historic commission. Um, yeah, and it, it came highly uh, recommended by the historic commission committee, historic commission itself. So, so that's yeah. So that's moving forward, and and for all practical purposes, what's considered a historic building is any building that's older than fifty years old. So that's going to be um, something to pay attention to because 50 years is pretty young in Amherst. So um, that is something to to consider and that I anticipate the council will have a lot of discussion about. So um, that's some, another place where you can weigh in if you have thoughts. I know, Adrian, you just said that uh, Orchard Valley has a lot of houses that are 60 years old. So my house is historic. <laughs> Not, yes. not only Orchard Valley, you've got Echo Hill, you have some of the major mm -hmm. developments in the 60s. We're all 50 years and plus, so I applaud this uh, this new look at the demolition delay uh, bylaw and urge you to move expediently on it uh, because there are historic buildings and mm -hmm. uh, those of us down here, we're not, we're old, but we're not too historic. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the other thing to consider is very soon, I believe within 10 years, uh, between 10 or 20 years, most of Amherst Woods will be in that, that as well. Yes. Um, so, so there's a lot, there's a lot of housing that um, mm -hmm. there's, it'll be a real, I'm really excited about this discussion. I also want to give a lot of credit to specifically Ben Brager on the town staff, but also mm -hmm. our historic commission um, and Jane Wald, for those who know Jane, they worked right. incredibly hard on this and they, they deserve a lot of credit as well. Mm -hmm. So um, we did this one already. Sorry, I went backwards. Okay. So in our committees, we kind of touched on this briefly, but as a reminder, Shalini and I both sit on town services and outreach. Um, my, my reason for only taking one committee is that I do also serve as uh, vice president with the council. And then Shalini is, uh, sits on the community resources committee. And so we talked briefly about these, but we wanted to dig into a couple of them uh, quickly. So Shalini, zoning priorities. Oh, this is fun to read. Ooh. So uh, <laughs> you can see that was my slide. Um, maybe I should 
put it up as uh, should I share my slide or make it bigger right. somehow? I could just share my Excel sheet. I think the basic idea over there is um, that we have a lot of in the community resources committee there are a lot of prior uh, important things we're working with especially related to zoning right with respect to housing or um, uh, climate action goals and so i'm just going to actually share my screen it's easier that way and the idea was how do we prioritize these and so we created a matrix where we are prioritizing uh, are starting to, as a committee, look at the different goals that we uh, priorities based on our town goals. So let me just very quickly show you. Uh, share screen. Okay. Okay. Can everyone see that? So, and the yellow colored ones are basically coming from the town staff. So they're color coded and oops. Yeah. So uh, along here, we have all the different like uh, the flood map, solar bylaw assessment and siting uh, bylaw, the design standards that uh, we want to create for the BGBL. There's article 14 permanent use of whatever. There's a uh, demolition bylaw parking. Um, uh, the housing um, uh, zoning issues, group living, marijuana use. So all the yellow colored priorities are coming from the town staff. The blue ones are coming from, I believe it's the town, uh, town council. And the so, housing. what's that? Is it the blue, the comprehensive housing policy ones? Oh yeah. Okay. Thank you. So those are the comprehensive uh, housing. Yeah, you're right. And so those are allowing owner duplexes. I'm not going to go into details, but the idea is that we're doing a lot of very interesting stuff here related to zoning. And the idea was to try and map this out along here with our climate action goals, social justice and equity goals, economic goals, affordable housing, our comprehensive housing policy that we adopted as a council, and then see which ones, like which ones should we be working on? And so we try to, as a group, rate them on these different um, goals. And, um, and so that will drive what we really pay attention to. So that's kind of what we're doing here. So um, I'm just being mindful of time. We only have about yes. a half an hour. We want to okay. get about seven other things. Stop sharing. So, Stop sharing. Um, okay. No, 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 no apology necessary. I think we yeah. tend to get excited about all the things we're talking we about. So, um, so the next thing up is the rental registration bylaw. So we'll do a really, maybe a really brief overview, Shani, and of the of the work. Plan. Yes, I think the big thing around the rental registration bylaw is again, okay. So there is a work plan. So if you want to participate in a particular, again, you can see this was a slide I sent. So it's kind of myopic. Um, this is available in the CRC packet. Um, as well, right. we would like to see a clear the CRC packet from this today. From today, yeah. Um, yeah. It, so April twenty eighth. If you look at the CRC, and that way you can see uh, what topic you might be interested in, or just come because for the next like April twenty eighth, May twelfth, May twenty first, we will be discussing the rental registration bylaw, and this tells you what aspect of the bylaw we're discussing and the overall reason for the sponsors to promote this bylaw is that we want to make sure that we are ensuring good quality housing and and right now our inspection is complaint driven so only if there's a complaint the house is inspected and often tenants don't know or don't have the power to complain and so a lot of housing is not well maintained but by instituting this in a good way, we will have a regular inspection system in place. So I'm going to just stop there unless anyone has any questions. So we, we do want to hear from residents, students, uh, landlords, um, and uh, what, you know, what, what would you like to see in the new um, registration bylaw that would ensure the quality of housing in your neighborhood? 
So next up, we're going to talk about parking, um, and Shalini will talk through the bulk of it, but essentially what this yeah, is. Talk, yeah. Okay, ahead, um, sure. So let me know if I miss anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we had, uh, we had um, Jason Skeels, who's our town engineer, and Bilford Mooring from BPW come through to talk to us about how they make decisions about caving. Um, and I honestly did not know that I would be as intrigued. I should have guessed. At this point, I should know. Like, even if it sounds boring, I'm going to be really excited about it. Uh, but basically, what they what they do is they have this little car that they drive around, and they've got all of these cameras on it. And they do scans every few years. They go around and do scans of our roads to figure out what we need, what the priority areas are for paving. Um, with climate change, this is not necessarily predictable. Some because the um, freeze and thaw cycles have shifted so much. Uh, for those of you who are down near me on Bay Road, you know, Bay Road was actually okay a couple of years ago. And then in this past winter, Bay Road went poof, right? So, um, so you can see what they're, what they're looking for. And they use something called a PCI, which um, the pavement condition index, thrilling, I know. And uh, that gives you sort of the rating for the road. Lynn, don't shake your head at me. It is thrilling. So um, the, the roads in Amherst, I know this is a little fuzzy, but if you would like to look at this, you can find this slide deck in the, uh, what month is it? Uh, this was yes. April 21st, uh, yeah. uh, town service is an outreach packet. So you can see we are looking at some roads that are serious. So if you look down here, that is Pomeroy. Um, and you can see where these roads that are in really serious condition are, very poor condition, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, Alice. I'm looking down at, at, at where Applewood is, and the road is in Bay Road is in terrible condition. We have lots of potholes, but it looks green there. I think this might be from. Oh, you're talking about this stretch of Bay Road. I'm looking at, at Bay Road near the Hadley line. Yeah, where, let me. Bay Road, um, was... Bay Road <laughs> what is in the it, Bay Road was one of the roads identified for fixing in 2022. Yeah, know. but yeah, but I, I think the major, yeah, the major part of it, Alice is right, is down here on the uh, mm -hmm. where are we west eastern side, the eastern right. side western right. side mm -hmm. around Applewood beyond Atkins toward Applewood is pretty bad. So I know the part you're talking about. There is a little stretch. Of, there is a little stretch of yellow in there. It's kind of small to see on this map. Um, so we had a really interesting conversation about how they're how they're scored and rated. And so I would encourage you to look zoom in on this and then look at the other some of the other streets around too because um one of the things in our discussion we found that sometimes uh comparatively uh you look at the type of damage that there is right so potholes versus bumps and things like that it all that all plays into how it's rated and and if you don't think something is correct on our the list of paving you can always reach out to to dpw to see if they when the last time they looked at it was um, because that was one of the other things they said was this past winter even really changed things from the last time they said it. It may be that that's, that it's relatively better than, than other places, but it doesn't mean it's bad. good. I know, I know. Yeah. So, <laughs> and they so also this, have a list. Sorry, they, they, I don't know if you're showing that. I don't know your time. You are. Oh, okay. It's up. Yeah, I'll, I'll show you. But you, do you want to talk about it? Yeah, no, I was just going to say that uh, one thing that Gil from Mooring said, which was very cool, is that it this whole software really allows us to remove the politics from paving which i thought was really cool because oh. now we have a very uh, systematic way of looking at what deserves um you know taking care of and it's not based on people who are making the most noise yeah and the reason for that uh -huh. is because you know we look at this look at that right so if we did all of our roads at one time we would need 48 million hey mindy do you have you have almost 49 million for us for roads? Like, no, I mean, Mindy's great, but that's just not realistic. And so we need to, we need to phase this. Um, it's, it's not possible. And then if we did it all at once, we'd have to fix it all at once again in like five years. So, yeah. um, so noting this, right, we are, we're doing okay. I think we can do a little bit better than yellow. Um, but looking at the, um, the length of pavement network that needs to, to be fixed, we have three miles that are considered very poor. I think one or two of those is Pomeroy. Um, we have 41 miles. Most of our West roads. Pomeroy also. West Pomeroy. Sorry, sorry. I think that might be what I'm mixing. I always just. No, call it's Pomeroy. not Anna. I saw Pomeroy. I did not see West Pomeroy. So, Pomeroy, Pomeroy is pretty bad. 
So Pomeroy is due for recon. Am I right? That's Pomeroy, right? Um, down from yeah. So Pomeroy is due for reconstruction. This is the suggestion map. So suggested. Um, you can see where these where pink is where complete reconstruction is. Yellow is mill and overlay. So important to note in District Five, there's several sections that are recommended for mill and overlay. Um, green is we're going to hold off on it for now. It will get done later. But again, we don't have forty nine million dollars. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, blue is crack and crack seal or surface treatment. So that's when you see like the squiggly lines when they fill it in. So worst roads, uh, if anyone, I was thinking about making trophies, but I decided not to. So worst roads as of spring 2022, Stony Hill Road takes the takes the win. Um, and you can notice here the square square yard cost of repair, right? So when we Anna, look at may, may I interrupt you? I'm so sorry. But no, isn't no. this based on it's it's worst roads, but it's based on usage of isn't it based on yeah. the frequency because I can tell you any number of roads, you know, nothing gets us as worked up as roads. I know. So, it, so I, I yeah. would like it to be clear that this is Thank based you. on usage. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, usage we're is part of it. In arms here. <laughs> it's not only usage, but usage is a significant factor. They take all of that. Right. So when Shalini was saying, like, it's not the politics of it, they actually, it's really an equation, which is, which is very cool. So yeah. these are the, um, the, this is what was done in 2022. Um, mm -hmm. So they've started, uh, they worked on, they did work on Bay Road a little bit. Um, and they're working on Leverett Road, Meadow Street, et cetera, et cetera. I know I'm going really fast. So 2023, mm -hmm. this is what they're hoping to, to work on as well. Um, College Street, Stony Hill, Old Farm, et cetera, et cetera. So then uh, 2023 preventative maintenance, this is the ones that are not getting milled or not getting totally reconstructed. These are the ones that will be um, trying to defer or prevent, sorry, by doing small maintenance as well. So Shea Street, um, yeah, Nancy. Anna, I can tell that you're really turned on by the technology here, I which I love. It's like I remember the having a display of um, how they tell how much water is being used. And it is so accurate that they can tell when the Super Bowl halftime comes because everyone goes and flushes their toilet oh my God. and the water use goes up. It's wonderful to watch. I love it. Um, I just want to pass on to you in the hope that you may also be uh, equally intrigued by what I recently learned about what's happening in some places in Europe in which they're using old plastic bottles mm. to make a new plastic road surface. And I know I sent it to Lynn and I sent it to Paul and they both said, yeah, we should look into that. Unfortunately, the company that's doing it is from the Netherlands, and I don't know whether anybody here is doing it, but what a what a great opportunity to take care of the roads and get rid of plastic at the same the time. Yeah. So yeah. I leave it to you. That'll be your goal. All right, I'll, I'll do that right after I get Wi-Fi for the full time. So um, <laughs> the other the other thing that we talked about in this that Nancy you just reminded me of is how we can work on not just repaving in the same way that we've always been doing, but how can we do upgrades without totally breaking the bank. So I'm trying to encourage us to do things like, um, if folks know that reflective, the reflective paint that has um, like a shine on it uh, when you paint the shoulder. On places like Southeast Street and Bay Road, um, I would encourage them to do something like that for the safety of pedestrians and cyclists. Um, oh. And the, the downside is that it's more expensive. And so it's one of the things that um, it would be, re it's really important for us to understand how can we, when, if we're ripping up the whole road anyway, let's factor in improvements for specifically cyclists and pedestrians um, as well as we go. So that, that's a conversation that we, we are having at TSO um, and we will continue to have and ask for um, as we come. Yeah. Oh, I do see Tracy Zafan just joined us and Aaron is also here they wanted to say anything but also can we do a time check because i think we announced the the meeting from 6 30 to 8 okay we're good, we're good. yeah all right 20 minutes okay perfect. so so um i want to just i'm this is really just an fyi i'm not going to get into the budget process but we are starting it on budget season so a uh, quick timeline very simplified lynn may want to fact check me on this because i could be very wrong but 
The deadline for the council to get the budget from the town manager is May 2nd. Typically it's May 1st, but May 1st is a Sunday this year. So we're giving him an extra day. Um, so on May 2nd, the town manager has to give us the budget draft. This will not include the regional school budget. And the reason for that is we are in a region with other towns that have town meeting. And so we work with their schedules as well. We are voting, voting, I can say that word, on the uh, regional budget on May 2nd. That's at our council meeting on, on May 2nd. So all the rest of the budget will be draft to us. The regional budget will be voted on. We then refer it to the finance committee, um, which is comprised of council members and some resident members as well. The finance committee does the bulk of this budget work, right? So they review the budget. They hear presentations from each department. They hold a public hearing. Usually I believe when that is joint with the council, a uh, public hearing on the full budget and then they report recommendations back to the full council within 30 days. So they, um, they're they planning on doing that even in fewer than 30 days. They're saying that they're gonna be done with that by May 26th. Um, June 6th, tentatively, uh, we will hold a public hearing on the capital improvement program and the full budget, full operating budget. And then by June 30th, we have to be done. So um, I am sure Lynn wants us to be done far before June 30th, but that is our deadline. Um, she is nodding. So to clarify, uh, this is a huge long list, but the reason I wanted to show you this is if you want to listen to specific departments talk about what they're asking for in this budget, this is the schedule for these. This can be found in the finance committee packet. I cannot remember the exact date, Lynn, if you know it, um, but this is in the finance committee, the um, finance committee packet for, for this last Tuesday. Last Tuesday, thank you. So briefly want to remind you, because as budget season approaches, what I have noticed is that people often do not understand what the council can do with budgets. So the town council can adopt the budget with or without amendments by June 30th. We can only delete or decrease amounts, except for expenditures that Massachusetts or federal law, requ Massachusetts law requires. We cannot move line items around. I cannot say I am taking this money from trails, just because you know I would never do that. I'm gonna take this money from trails and put it into paving. Um, no matter how excited I am about paving, I still can't do that. We give the town manager guidelines. He builds the budget based on those guidelines. We can only say yes, yes or fix it. We cannot tell him specifically what we want to see changed. So as you make public comment, just keep keep that in mind. Oh, we um, we talked about this. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I just mention two addendum to what you talked Please. about? And addendums one, are right in here. You can you can imagine. The hearing that. is for the hearing on the general budget is going to be at five o'clock on the sixteenth of May. Oh, sixteenth of May. All right. Don't look at my slides then because they're wrong. Thank you. And it was scheduled for the 16th of May during the regular council meeting, but because it took at least almost two hours, maybe more last year, uh, we've decided to schedule it earlier in the, at, in the evening at five. And then the other thing is there is one item in the budget that we actually can increase, and that is the elementary school budget. So we can do that by a two thirds vote, am I right? That's correct. Got one right. Um, so yeah, if we if we do increase the elementary school budget, we would need to do it by a two thirds margin. Thank you, Lynn. And, yeah, thank you, Lynn. And can we point out? I think Rosemary and others who are interested in the working with the senior center that the senior center senior center related uh, discussion is on seventeenth May at ten forty five. So I want to um, before. This is a blazing fast one, then we're going to turn it over to Mindy in like three minutes. Mindy, you're on in three. So um, upcoming events around town, just things to note and not miss. Uh, Farmer's Market is open, which is really exciting. Um, I was away last weekend, and I'm so excited to get there this weekend. Uh, this Saturday, April 30th, um, is town, it's town cleanup day. Um, there'll be various locations around town to do some pickup. I will be at Groff Park. Shalini, I think you're coming to, you're going to be at Groff Park? Yes, we are. Um, and then after the pickup, which I believe is at 10, uh, on the town common, there will be, on the, on the common right here, 
right here where you can clearly see this I'm pointing out my window, will be a uh, mm -hmm. celebration as well put on by the chamber and the bid. Um, and that you can register for the cleanup part on the Amherst Engage website. Uh, May 1st, the Jones Library has an open house. Um, they are hoping that you will come help us envision the future of the new library. So from 12 o'clock to two o'clock, you can drop in at any point, please come, I'll be there. Um, I know a, a lot of other counselors are, are attending as well. Yeah, and I think it's a really good opportunity for us to envision together what we want to see. And they're going to have different tables related to climate action goals towards us, you know, um, team programming or so whatever ideas you have, bring your young ones and and participate in this fun. And there's going to be childcare, I believe, from 12 to 1 available. Uh, the Drake is having their grand opening on May 2nd. I will say if you were able to go last week to, or this week to any of the shows I went on Tuesday, it's beautiful. Um, it's, it's really going to be such an amazing community resource. So I encourage you to support them. Uh, on, I know that I had some, uh, some bears hanging out at my house last week and our Shalini's had some bears. And on yep. May, May 4th, we have a web bear in our, um, which is very funny. And uh, that is with Dave Waddles, who's from the, uh, he's a black bear and fur bear biologist uh, from Department of, or Division of Fish and Wildlife. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, I, you, oh, sorry. Yeah, no, 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 I was just, I was just so excited about it because suddenly I see in my backyard, I mean, never, I've never, ever, ever seen a bear for real. And it's there and was just so relaxed. It seemed like it was comfortable having people around because I stepped out, took pictures, my cat came and it just looked at us and walked by. But I think the focus of um, the, the talk with them is how can we cohabit because we live in bear country or bear area. So how do we cohabit with bears? And I think that's a really important thing for us to learn with children they're playing outside or uh, now we're going to have composting outside on the streets or garbage. So, you know, how do we work and live? peacefully and in harmony with our bears. Yeah, how do we make it so the bears aren't super comfortable with us around and walk away? Um, so I bears are my second favorite, first or second favorite animal, depending on the day. I adore them and I, it's really challenging for me because I, all I want to do is just hug it and I know that it doesn't want to be hugged. All right, so the elementary school building committee has another um, public engagement opportunity May 5th at 6.30 p.m. So I would encourage you, if you go to the Elementary School Building Committee website, you can register for that. And then the last thing, this is a short list. There's so much happening, y'all. Uh, the uh, Cup of Joe with Paul and the Finance Director, Sean Mangano, specifically about the budget is May 6th at 8.30 a.m. That is via Zoom. Um, so, so consider, attending these as well. Yeah, and I think that's another really great opportunity in a very informal setting to talk with Paul one-on-one -on -one about what's going on. Why are you doing this or not doing this? Or what can we do? So I think the Cup of Joe is a great time to, um, in a small setting, talk with him about finance. Yeah. Um, oh, I forgot this one, sorry. Uh, Martha. Um, yes. Maybe yes. two more. Okay, well, th thank you. Yes, the, our, our league, uh, is going to host a community-wide reception that's for everybody in Amherst uh, to welcome our new le leadership for crafts and the diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, some of you have probably already met the new CREST director, Earl Miller, who is just such a bundle of energy. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> He's just amazing. The DEI leader, uh, director has not been hired yet, but uh, apparently there are now candidates who would love to come and work with Earl Miller. And, and, mm. and so I think there's going to be a, a good suite of candidates and our own Jennifer Moyston is, is the assistant uh, DEI director. She's apparently, mm -hmm. you know, she's been doing the job behind the scenes for two years, you know, she's just uh, terrific. But we want this to be a time when everybody can come. Uh, the, however, there is a correction. We had a meeting today and decided we would change the time to be from three to 5 p.m. And that's because it's a big climate action uh, event on the town common that ends at two and we wanted not to conflict with them. So uh, we have the uh, uh, Goff Park reserved. Uh, we're going to have music. We're going to have uh, free food. Uh, and we would, I'd uh, like to ask you folks to just publicize this any way you can. We'll have a 
Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we'll have a corrected um, um, one of one of those, mm -hmm. you know, in a, by to, hopefully by tomorrow <laughs> to mess around. But and I, I will be sending out a, a, an official invitation to the town council members to attend uh, and so on. And uh, we've already I've already talked with Paul and Jennifer and and Earl uh, about it. Um, so we really hope that a lot of people will come to to help celebrate because it really is a new beginning for this town mm -hmm. uh and and i think it's really important that uh people get excited about it and i frankly think anybody who meets earl will be excited mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. if, if he, I mean, he hit the ground running and has not stopped um he's doing a phenomenal phenomenal job yes yeah but I mean, people have been working very hard on this for 18 years. Oh, yeah. Yes. And, uh, and, and so it's finally be really beginning to come to fruition. You know, mm -hmm. there's still a long process to go. But um, and so we're, of course, we'll be asking the town council to really make a good commitment financially for the next fiscal year uh, to support Crafts as it gets going and so on, and uh, to to support the the DEI director and you know then to work on uh, proposals of how to increase funding and uh, so on and 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 so forth. But we think it's really important for the community overall to hear from the council that yes, there's a commitment uh, mm -hmm. for the longer term. You know, even if you agonize over finances, you don't want it to come across as you're negative about the program because of the finances, which is which has come across sometimes before with to some people at least. So um, anyway, so please, please come. And uh, yes, uh, we will get the corrected announcement out shortly. Beautiful. Yeah, and we owe so much gratitude to the Community Safety Working Group and um, generally local activists for, for supporting this as, as it's gone ahead as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know how to erase my annotations, but oh, I know how to erase my annotations. So um, briefly, we've got a couple uh, pending and current vacancies. So Zoning Board of Appeals, we really, really need people. Uh, so if you know folks who might be interested in Zoning Board of Appeals um, or the Solar Bylaw Working Group, these are two that have current vacancies. And then we have um, uh, potential upcoming vacancies on planning boards. Some folks cycle off uh, their, their, their term that comes up. So a uh, full list of vacancies for other committees, which there are plenty of ways to get involved. So if you want to add something to your already impressive list of civic engagement, that is, uh, that is the way to do it. Mindy! <laughs> Would you like to tell us what's happening at the state house? Sure, but would you like to tell me how much time I have? <laughs> could, you, could, you do it, could you do it in five to seven? Um, we have a budget. <laughs> uh, the house passed the budget last night. Well, first of all, hi everybody. Um, there's a couple updates. Redistricting will go into effect in terms of uh, state rep districts and Senate districts in January, not before. I just wanna stress that. Um, the third Hampshire district includes Pelham until December 31st. It also includes Amherst and half of Granby. After January 1st, it will continue to represent all of Amherst and half of Granby, but not Pelham. Um, so just keep that in mind. Uh, Senator Comerford's district changes a little bit, but she still represents all of Amherst now and later. Um, but I really wanna stress that because I think there's a lot of confusion on the part of residents thinking that the new districts are in effect right now, they're not. Although um, the elections that will happen in September and November are for the new districts. So if you lived in Pelham, you'd be seeing me at the Pelham Library in September, but you wouldn't have a chance to vote for me on September 6th. So keep that in mind. Um, I am on the ballot. So thank you, everybody. Um, I am running for re-election. I'm just going to take a moment to say that. We, the House did pass a budget last night. Thank you, Shalini. Um, and it is close. So the budget process is the governor gives us his budget. While he's crafting his budget, the House and the Senate hold these joint hearings and bring in the governor's departments and they tell us how much they think they need and for what purpose. Um, and they also, the House and the Senate determine, um, come to consensus on what they think the revenue is gonna be for the year. So how much money do they have to spend? And they also hear from the governor what he wants to do. 
Um, usually I'm told in the past, the house just like copy and pasted the governor's budget and with little tweaks here and there. That did not happen. That has not happened since I've been there. And it certainly didn't happen this time. They basically did not use the governor's budget as a model for most departments. And I am, I have to tell you, I am so proud of this budget and I had so little to do with it, but nonetheless, I am so proud that we have that, this kind of budget in Massachusetts. So the house goes first when it concerns money. Our budget process started in January. So as part of that process, I met with the chair of House Ways and Means. I told him what my statewide priorities were and what my local priorities were. He hears that from as many reps who wanna schedule one-on-one -on -one meetings with them. So not everybody does, but a lot of us do. Then he kind of hears about what's going on in the state. He's hearing from us, he's hearing from the speaker. He developed, he and his staff develop a budget which they presented to us about 10 days ago. We have an unbelievably short period of time to create amendments. It's like, it turned out to be like two and a half days because of Good Friday. It comes out on a Wednesday. We have till Friday at five to submit amendments. And these are all kinds of amendments for statewide programs, local priorities, otherwise known as earmarks, et cetera. Um, and then his staff over that weekend through school vacation week, sort through all those amendments and categorize them by topic or like department, like environment, um, education, early education and childcare, public health, judiciary, basically following like the joint committee structure. And then this past week, we go and we advocate for our amendments in a, in, um, a room. It, it can be a virtual room, but it's also an actual room. Um, and each, each legislator gets to make their pitch for why their amendments should be completely funded. And then they take all those amendments in that category. They put them all together in a consolidated amendment and basically they pick and choose which ones are gonna go in the consolidated and which aren't. So you're not gonna get all your amendments, but where did you go? So generally speaking, when we get the consolidated for the most part, a lot of times I search and look for words like Amherst, Pelham, Granby, depending on what um, amendments I put in. Um, and this year I also put in some statewide. So I go, you know, extension service, things like that. And you can see what comes back. And then generally speaking, since we've all had a good opportunity to advocate for these um, amendments, we don't vote against the consolidated amendment because it, it is what it is. You can vote against it, but it's still gonna go through and it's our job to make a budget. So we passed the budget, meaning the last consolidated amendment last night, the budget is close to $50 billion. It will go to the Senate. They will add a ton of money. After a couple of years in the state house, I now understand the process. The state, you know, the house goes first, and we're a little bit more cautious just because the house is cautious to tell you the truth. Um, and a little bit more careful about not spending money we don't have. And members don't get that much money to do earmarks because there's 160 of us. I actually think they should give us each a million bucks and just take 160 million off the top, but nobody's going for that idea. Um, it goes to the Senate, they get a lot more money because there's only 40 senators. And in the, the joke is everybody is a chair in the Senate, which isn't actually a joke. Everybody is a chair in the Senate, so they can all direct resources to them. But that's good because when you've got a great relationship with your senator, like I do, if there's a local earmark that didn't get funded in one house, I can say to, I can advocate with Joe to say, is this something you'd be interested in doing? And she'll pick it up sometimes and move it forward if she hasn't already got her list of local priorities. So the Senate will work on theirs towards the end of May. It'll be different than ours. It'll be a lot more money than ours. And there'll be things that we won't want, things that we will want. They'll have to go to conference. They'll come up with a brand new identical budget. And then it goes to the governor. He either signs it or, and it goes into law. He vetoes the whole thing or he vetoes parts of it. In the past couple of years, he's made a lot of line item vetoes. The House has come back in and so has the Senate. We overrode every single one. This year, I think it's gonna be a matter of timing because if, he, if we're very late, which we weren't, we were actually early. So if we're very late and he waits the full 10 days before he has to sign it, it could potentially be when we're in recess and recess this year is a reelection recess. So people aren't gonna really wanna come back. And that means the session clock will tick and we'll have to come back in January as a whole new body and re-pass the budget and re-override them, which can happen, but hopefully it won't. 
So let me just tell you a couple of things if I have a couple of minutes. Do I have, I think I have two more minutes. Yes, this yes. Is great. So being from New York is now coming in handy in terms of the speed with which I'm talking. Um, so <laughs> the budget is about $50 billion. I wanna tell you some of the things that are in it. $110 million for universal school meals. We didn't have to fight for that. The budget came to us with the chairman of Ways and Means hearing that this was important to every district in the state and he put it in. Awesome, Amherst benefits from this. Superintendent Mike Morris sent a letter in advocating for this. There's another thing that was baked in, in the budget that we received, no cost phone calls for people who are incarcerated, huge. The best way you wanna prevent recidivism is you keep people in jail connected to their community. How do they do that? Through phone calls. Right now, up until this budget passes, we charge folks in jail an arm and a leg for phone calls, so much so that they can't afford it. This takes that out. It says there, it's, there's a fund, it's gonna pay for it, and it orders sheriffs to come up with a plan that's not gonna gouge the state. So it's good news. Um, another thing, it bans child marriage, another big get. Um, there's a genocide education trust fund that was funded at $500,000. This is big. We passed a law this year to make sure that genocide education happened in schools. Some teachers were upset because it was like an unfunded mandate. How are they gonna get training? We've now endowed a trust fund so they can get the training to be able to do that. When you look at what's going on in the world, and I'm actually here with you today, it's Holocaust Remembrance Day. It's clearly an important thing to have a genocide education program in our schools so that students and Massachusetts residents can see the signs of fascism and respond accordingly. Um, another thing, it has a common app for state benefits. This has been something that we've been fighting for for a long time. Right now, if you're a person with limited income and you wanna qual and you wanna apply and you got convinced that it's okay to apply for food stamps, um, rental assistance, mass health, a whole bunch of state programs, you have to fill out like 10 different, very complicated applications. Ridiculous, a barrier, a really significant barrier. When a computer program could figure it all out and say what you're, what you're qualified for. In this budget, a common app is being paid for. Um, another one, a half a million dollars for abortion care um, services infrastructure. Uh, another one that I love that I've been advocating for this year a great deal is we don't allow young adults to access HIV prevention medicine without a parental consent. So right now, right now for the past decade or so, we've had excellent HIV prevention in the form of a pill. But if you're a young adult, you can't get that with parent, without parental permission, which means you have to disclose to your parent why you think you need HIV prevention. And that could either be you don't want to disclose your sexual orientation or you don't want to disclose your sexual activity. We don't make teenagers do that to get STD services. For that, we uh, treat them as emancipated adults. So it's a real way of shaming, quite frankly, young gay adults. So in this budget, we included, there's legislation that Rep. Jack Lewis from Framingham has been introducing for the past three terms. We included his legislation that allows young adults to get HIV prevention without a parental consent. Here's why I think this is important and why I've been advocating for it. With what's going on in the world right now, or not the world, let's think about just the country. We've got don't say gay happening in curriculum um, in Florida. We've got in Texas, they're criminalizing parents who are trying to get gender affirming health care for their transgender kids. And we've got, you know, sort of these efforts across the country to really shame and silence LGBT adults and kids. And not only shame and silence, but erase them. They're not there. They're not going to be in the history books. They're not going to be on the books in the library shelf. That's kind of scrub the country clean. I really feel like at this point in Massachusetts, the legislature has to be extremely proactive in saying, we see you in every way that we can. So this legislation says it to young adults. I also have been advocating for the Healthy Youth Act for the same reason, been advocating for Gender X, the bill that I have in to put in a non-binary gender marker on every state form and application for the same reason, because I really feel we have to do something. It's not enough just to say, oh, we're great. We're Massachusetts. Not, that's not going to happen here. In Ludlow, I don't know if you heard, there's a, there's a lawsuit happening around 
parents requiring that they find out if their child in school is asking to be um, referred to by a different gender. And they're suing the school system for this. So it's happening. We have to respond. We have to respond saying we're protecting people. We're keeping, we're making sure that people are safe in schools, safe at work, safe in the library, wherever. Um, do I have one more minute or did I go over? I think I went over. I just yeah. want to know what, uh, what about East West Rail, Mindy? Oh, okay. Well, I can do, um, well, we like to call it West East Rail. Yeah, we do. That's true. West but East I'm not sure if that's actually going to get us West East Rail. So I'm, a, I'm a, I actually, I don't care what we call it as long as we get it. Um, I actually am willing to say let's call it the Baker Express as long as it happens. Uh, and I'm not a big fan of Baker. So, um, well, let, we'll have to see what happens. I mean, I think that we met with, we've been meeting with the Congress people from the area, McGovern and Neal, um, because there is a lot of federal infrastructure money coming in. We wanna make sure that Western Mass Rail is included in it. We had this meeting with the governor on this week um, where I think he tried, so um, this is being recorded. So um, where I think <laughs> he, he indicated to us, mm -hmm. the good news is he indicated to us that in order for us to get this federal money, um, we would be in a good position to get it, or we'd be competitive if we had a rail authority, which we don't have in Western, in anywhere in the mm. Commonwealth. And he also told us that his staff in MassDOT had been working up rail authority options. Um, mm. That we asked him why it wasn't included in the transportation bond that has come before the legislature. And he indicated that he didn't want to spoil it because the legislature never goes along with what he asks for. So if he didn't, if he was afraid, if he put it in the bond, then we would reject it. So um, we'll be working with MassDOT to see what they have done since they apparently have a lot of research on this. Um, and the other piece of it is we asked about sustainable streams for revenue for it because mm -hmm. the infrastructure money will help to build it but it may cost several million, you know, like 30, $50 million a year to maintain it. And some legislators have all different ideas about this. Some people want some percentage of the sales tax to be generated, come back to Western Mass. Other people have other ideas. And the governor also has an idea about how to sustain it, but he's not telling us yet. It's a secret. He's gonna check with his staff he said, I have an idea, but I don't want to say because sometimes I get in trouble if I say, so he's going to talk to his staff. So I hope he tells us soon what his idea is for sustaining revenue. So the good news is he seemed interested in rail. He's dedicated staff time to rail. He has an idea about sustainable revenue sources for rail and uh, to be continued. Andy, thank you so much for all of your, your work and your advocacy. Thank I think you. you're, yes. uh, thank you. I'll speak for myself to say I'm very excited to see your name on the ballot again. So thank, oh, you. thank you. Thank you for continuing <laughs> to be willing to serve. Thank you very uh, much. Can I also just say, Nancy, Eddie, please send me that article on the plastics for roads. In my position on the ENRA committee, I'd like to see how they recycle it. Yeah. Thank so, you. Will do, Mindy. Thanks. Send, send, it, send it to me too. <laughs> um, so thank you all. I apologize that we went over. I'm happy to stick around for a little bit if folks do want to um, have, have any questions. I will, We will keep working on our timing. I think we get really excited about all of this stuff and then forget that the point is really open time. So um, I'm, I'm happy to hang around. I, and, and again, um, to reach us, you can always email us. Um, I'm going to be starting up my outdoor office hours uh, every Friday from 4.30 to 6. Uh, for right now, I'll be on the South Amherst Common. I got a tent, so uh, rain or shine, I will be hanging out. And if you've noticed, there are now tables. Lynn, don't laugh at me. I got a tent. Um, and so so uh, there are tables there now. And um, I'd love to talk, come talk to me and, and come hang out. So uh, unless it's lightninging, then I will not be there. Thunderstorming, that's the term. Not laughing at you. I love your <laughs> <laughs> thank you. This has been a really interesting meeting. Yes, yes. and if you all want to record the next few meetings, uh, put them on your calendar. May 26th is uh, informal-ish meeting. All meetings are informal, but there'll be informal office hours May 26th, and then June 23rd will be the next formal District 5 meeting, and then July 28th, again, office hours. And on, I think in June, on June 23rd, we plan to invite Cress, our Cress Director, 
to them. So please spread the word and please let other people know. <laughs> Tell them to write to us so we can add them to our email list and invite more and let more and more people know that we're here for them. Okay. Thank you all so much. Martha, excuse me. Yeah, may I just Thank ask you all. The counts, we the appreciate counts? your good work. Yeah. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. Is the council planning to continue hybrid meetings so that the public uh, can, you know, zoom in and make comments? Yes, mm -hmm. even if the state, although I hope the state does pass uh, the ability to continue to meet virtually for all bodies. Mm -hmm. um, and if we go back as of July 15th to meeting in person, we will also have the Zoom available. That's for the total council meetings. What we can't afford is for the committees. It's just yeah, for all the committees, yeah. Meeting that's both in person and virtual mm -hmm. requires yeah. that you have an IT person very close by all the time. Yeah, good. Thank you. Yeah, and as always, we welcome feedback and ideas what you would like to spend more time on in our time together, or if there are any changes you would recommend. Maybe next time we'll go back to the old ways of doing the Zoom meeting where you can chat and there was a chat box. And um, so we'll try that again, as opposed to a webinar. So please write to us. Thank you all so much. Um, feel free to stick around or drop off. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week. Hope to see you sometime this weekend at the farmer's market or the cleanup. Or thanks. And I know that almost every person who attended tonight is a League of Women Voters member. <laughs> Mom and Tracy. Right, Adrian? I, I would like to give a shout out to Shalini and to Anna, and of course to our president for being here. But Mindy, if you're still with us, I so appreciate your newsletters. Oh. Um, some, some newspapers have a beacon call. We do not in this area, but thanks to your newsletters, we stay apprised of not only your activism, but your passionate, your passionate support for a lot of things that at least I, I support and uh, cheer you on. You may not always hear from me, but um, Cheers to you, Mindy. Keep up the good work on Thank behalf you, of Adrian. us all. Thank you so much. That's, that, that feedback means everything to me. Thank you so much. Everybody. Thank you. If you have questions, feel free to hang out and ask them. Otherwise, have a great day. I'm going to have I'm going to hang out for a little bit because I want to bring oh. something to both of your attention. Is that all right? Yes, Did you want to say something? Uh, and I do, uh, Anna and Shalini, if you have another minute, I would like to pass something by as well. Yes. Yeah, go for it. Absolutely. Um, uh, Adrian, do you want to go first? I don't want to cut in line in front of you. Uh, well, um, just the following. It goes back to Amherst Media mm -hmm. and the very full discussion you had Monday night. Although I was not part of uh, the contract between Amherst Media and the town, I was very much involved in the entire uh, negotiations with the Comcast lawyers um, and our team on the Cable Advisory Committee. I would ask both of you, Shalini and Anna, to take a look at the responsibility of the town working with our partner for a what is it now, six to eight weeks in helping find a place for Amherst Media. I know there is a split decision among the counselors in terms of whose responsibility it is, but I urge you to take a look at the Comcast contract between the town and Comcast uh, and Amherst Media to take a look at the fine print there in terms of supporting till the end of this contract period of uh, Amherst Media's and the town's responsibility to the citizens, not where we're going in, not where we're going in the future, but what we owe our channel 17, 12 and 15 or PEG channels in providing these services to the town now and through the contract. So mm -hmm. I urge you to do that. 
Adrian, thank you. And as you know, I, I spoke uh, advocated for our support of the town. But if you I have a specific uh, line, because I remember reading and it's in the contract very specifically said that um, if you're looking at it just legally, that the that Amos Media is responsible for finding a location. Um, but I feel that the work they do is so important and they're in a difficult spot and we should work with them. Um, but I don't know if I'm hearing you say that the contract says that the town is responsible for finding a location. Is that what you were saying? No. 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 She's, being, okay. she's being very specific. That the yeah, town, it see? sounds to me like the town's not responsible, but the town is sure. responsible to the, the residents to make sure that there is these services available. Is that what you're saying, Adrian? Oh, okay. Point on, perfect. Thank yeah. you, Mindy. I was okay. not clear. Absolutely. Wait, wait. Okay. So Thank if you. they don't have a location and they can't provide the services, then the town is responsible. Oh, yes. Okay, got you, got you. Okay. Yes. And Thank we you. cannot Thank jump ahead to the mm -hmm. 2026 contract. That mm. future issue is not on the table now. It's what is mm -hmm. the responsibility. And Mindy, you know that through the league, uh, we, and with your help and with all the new counselors, um, we embarked on a production with Amherst Media, mm. um, with Stan and myself, mm -hmm. um, really highlighting it. I mean, the, so the fact is, I don't want to see them out and dry. Absolutely. It's, it's a matter of fairness. It's a matter, matter of obligation to our citizens for this contract period. Right. So right. thanks right. for hearing me out. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Thank you Thanks so much. And thank you for that support, Shalini. As I said, I know there's a split decision and um, that's all I have to say. Right. So, Adrian, I think, say I think you're going to be recruited for that commission. Yes. <laughs> Your name is on my note piece of paper. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Adrian. So much, Adrian. Thank you. For kind for thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good to see you, Adrian. And Bye. Anna and Shalini, I don't want to put, yes. put, put too much on your list, but I wanted to follow mm -hmm. up on something I mentioned to you last summer that I've been um, that I forwarded to the town manager, which is around the broken railings on the bridge on one sixteen. Mm -hmm. And so I had so the people who run the Amherst Mobile Market over at Boulders South mm -hmm. Point were the first people to show it to me because they were concerned about the family members who go to Groff Park mm -hmm. and sometimes don't realize that the pedestrian bridge is for them. So I end up walking on the street and not only is it an eyesore, it's dangerous. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and there was also a point around sidewalks and access to Groff Park for people who might be walking there, not driving there, which mm -hmm. I know sounds ridiculous because but it seemed to be last summer that it was much more accommodating to people who had cars than people who were walking with strollers. Um, so I, when I brought it to the town manager, I suggested that they put a sign by the pedestrian bridge that's in two different languages, in English and Spanish, mm -hmm. that says something like, this is your bridge. <laughs> you right. know, you, this, this is not private property because you know when you're on Mill Lane, yes. there's a little oh, sign that says private property, say off. So if I would mm -hmm. think that would the bridge too. So some kind of signage that says use this bridge because that'd be mm -hmm. the same. But I thought the railings were gonna be fixed, but now I'm hearing that that may not be happening. So I just wanted to bring it to your attention because I think you met, Anna and I, Anna, did you meet with them, with the mobile market folks about it last summer? Mm, no, no, she I talked to me there a lot. Talked, yeah, we talked to them. Um, it wasn't an official meeting, but she did talk to us mm. about it. So, um, you know, I so last summer I was told that this would be fixed in the spring. So when mm. I so April comes around and I sent an email and just said, "Do you have a schedule for when the work will start?" And yeah. I know we don't know when it'll be completed because weather, etc. You know, when will it start? And I was told it may not, you know, my, the indication was, I don't think I actually was told it's not going to start in spring, but there wasn't a date. So I, I just want to, I want to bring it to your attention. No, thank you. I was told, and maybe Tracy, you know, the answer to this more than I do, but I, I yeah, thought looking. that one of the issues was that 116 was not maintained by, or not fully maintained by the town. That's because I, I asked, this is a question that I asked last year. And I said, yeah. mm -hmm. you need help with the state because it's 116. Mm -hmm. Right. 
No, but, but that's um, it's a state road. I mean, it's a town road all the way to the notch from downtown. Yeah. Right. And so, so the I, town I was, controls it. Yeah. So I was told it's not. Um, I, I offered. I said, you know, it, can I can I help with either on the state side with the meeting? Yeah. But, but I was told it's, you know, they've got well, it. Well, and the DPW has the plans to like improve along Mill Lane to the park, yeah. like to finish the work that was on East Hadley Road. Right. The railing has come up before, though. The bailing is unfortunately, Casey, isn't getting better by itself. No, it isn't. And there's also that one area, too, like near, like on the other side of the street, like where to cross the little bridge, you know, where there was a, I mean, that's, I've heard that's getting fixed, though. The, on, like, closer to, like, um, to the Pomeroy intersection, like, sort of near, the USDA building in the yeah. Hampshire, because right, everybody was being directed. There's, there's a concrete barricade there to go. I mean, that's been there forever. I've heard that that's getting fixed. Like, the, but I know people bring up the railing. I haven't heard anything yeah. definitive that the railing will be fixed. I haven't personally. either. And <laughs> so. I thought that, no, I haven't either. And I thought, I, I'm trying to remember who told me this now, because um, I thought that the reason that we were given was that it wasn't, the, the town didn't maintain that bridge, that that was a state road. And so clearly that's not true. Um, the road is a town road, my understanding, all the way to the notch. So like, for example, bridge, like Pomeroy, but that's the thing is, I think the bridge could would be- Would the bridge be different? different wait a minute, I can give something. you, the, so the, the information I have is, it's because I guess it's called the West Street Bridge, right? DPW needs to submit its application to the Conservation Commission to get the proper permits to perform the work and determine oh, no, that's, that's if there are any restrictions. And then the, the time frame I heard was it'll be happening shortly. So I guess I'm not necessarily, I'm just bringing it to your attention because I know I talked with you about it last spring when I first heard about it, since both of you were the council people. So I just wanted to bring you up to date rather than forward this mm -hmm. one. So I, I take a moment and just bring you up to date now and, and say again, if there's mm -hmm. anything I can do to help. If it turns out that it's a state issue, maybe because it's a bridge, I don't know. That's what I'm wondering, is that, you know, is there some um, But I it sounds like it has to go to the CONCOM too, right? So- It has to anyway, because it's water. Right. But but it's no, but that's I don't not think hard. there's a state issue yeah. because I haven't been told that, but right. if it turns yeah. out, I'm here. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure I'm you're sorry. right. I, I don't know why. But there is an issue about, I mean, some of the other improvements. I mean, DPW is waiting on some of the money. So I guess the question is, do they have the money for the bridge yet? Yeah, but this feels, that one feels like a health and safety, you know? No, of course. <laughs> I mean, you know, more than, more than any of us. Well, I don't know, but yeah. All right, I'm gonna write an email to Paul and ask and I'll get clarity and Mindy, I'll follow up. Yeah, can Thank you talk to me too? Sure. Is, yeah, we had this Thank one. Thank you very much. But again, it's, it's an offer that's out there if I can be of any assistance, um, if there is a state angle to this, which I don't think there is, but if there is, please let me know. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. Thanks for tonight, the two of you. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, for I think you're like the only ones who are having like regular meetings almost. Well, just like three sometimes. And yeah, yeah. I thought that was a council thing, sort of. Well, <laughs> technically, we only have to do two a year. Oh, well, there you go. That mm. just didn't feel like enough because clearly we need more than once a month because I can talk for 20 hours about pavement. <laughs> know that well, so I was Ooh, actually so Gilford and Maureen came to TAC tonight mm -hmm. and was presented that again. Oh uh -huh. yeah. So and we asked him more questions and stuff. Tracy, were there any questions about the section of Bay Road by the Hadley Line by Applewood? We didn't talk about that. Hmm. It at ours. Come up in PSO and either, but tonight folks were like, no, that section's really, really bad. And I'm, I just wasn't sure if it was one of those, like it happened after the last scan, kind of like the other part of Bay So Road. one thing that's interesting too is, so my neighbors, because I'm near Route 9 and Route 9, the Route 9, the west part of Route 9, right? It's all kind of not, uh, well, not very good right now. And, uh, and so I was shared with them and somebody said, well, when are they ever gonna fix our road? Like my street, of course, everybody's always about my street, my street, but um, so I shared with them the 2000, I mean, or somebody in the neighborhood sent the 2017 scan with the pavement condition index, the PCI. And then because the person had done that and they said, well, are they ever gonna update it? And then I shared because I thought the 
uh, the presentation Jason did was so good yeah. that I shared it um, with my neighbors. And then somebody said, well, our, the, the, my street, Blue Hills Road, is actually that the, its rating in, improved significantly, like from 2017 to now, and they haven't done any work on our street. So my neighbors are like, do I believe this? <laughs> or like, did you just like change the evaluation they, criteria? I'm wondering, like fewer people are on it or something. Or I mean, I don't really, some on. parts of the road are really not good at all. Yeah. Um, well, we, have I mean, of, cut, we have a lot of cut through UMass traffic. So the, the northbound direction is significantly more ripped up than the southbound. You know, that raises an issue. Like, I wonder if there was a usage part a variable in there this, was. Right? I wonder if roads get so bad that mm. people are using other roads, that the roads that they are deferring from end up looking better on the scans. Because Well, I mean, my neighbors are like, do we even believe this? Because now you're telling me, it's like, well, it was a C and now it's in B plus. <laughs> and like, how did that happen? Because you didn't yeah, actually do any work yet. <laughs> You can't pull that over academics. <laughs> All right, Mindy, in this budget, just say I want 49 million for Amherst Roads and just see what happens. So uh you know what? yeah. I'll put that in. I think there's 30 million for an elementary school, a little bit here, a little bit there. Pretty soon we're talking about real money. <laughs> All right, it's fine. And um just yeah, so somewhere else we, good. They don't need any more money. They're fine. Hey, yes, I mean, I'm hoping um that the DPW so. I mean, it is available, I guess, through the YouTube, like through the YouTube channel, but it'd be nice if they actually put it up like front and center that they were because going it's to. a good, um, it's a good presentation. Yeah, I thought it was really And it will answer a lot of questions. I mean, a lot of people, you know, really do say, well, what about my street or whatever? So it always is to give them some, it's good to have database decisions. Yeah, I think it would be really good if they could really clearly articulate sort of what the equation is though, because I do think you're still gonna have people that are like, my street's still terrible, it's not even on here, right? Like, I think it's important to note, like it's not just number of potholes. No, um, sure. And, and and they talk about that in the presentation, but it's not like its own slide. And I always am aware of like, when we just put slide decks up so much. Good. Oh yeah, no, I mean, you definitely want some of the conversation too. Totally, totally, but yeah. They did, yeah, they did clarify it's the main roads and like amongst the bad streets, the the way they prioritize is based on the high traffic, high volume. Well, so that's actually yeah. a question. So I know for TSO that they have a um, like a policy, you know, related to like parking requests and things. And it's like, whether it's an arterial or not, but so there's certain roads that are not considered like the major roads, the arterial mm -hmm. and the collectors, but in mm. the town's database, they call them, are, higher level roads because they mm. want them to get repaved more often like Lincoln or something that is mm -hmm. like supposed to be more of a neighborhood street but it's also like a sort of priority street mm. so they bump it up in the rating but then you wouldn't want it to be considered like a higher level like a collector street when it's really mm. more of a neighborhood street but just for paving priority they'll bump it they will and the real and the thing too, I mean, what I told my neighbor is if you look at the capital budget, I mean, typically it's only like two to three miles of road a year get repaved. Mm -hmm. And we have like over a hundred miles of road. There are a hundred town owned miles. Wow. And so you're you're just in the queue. You like you can't get them all. <laughs> And it's like 41 of them are are like need to be prioritized too. Like that's the yeah. Anyway. So, anyway. Uh, hmm. Yeah. Thank you both so much. I appreciate it. But the, um, I just wanted to, I, mm. so I had sent you the information on the Pomeroy project. Yeah, you did. And, um, did you get my email back? I said that, yeah, you were going to ask about when it goes to the council. Yeah, I'm just not sure. Is it? So the DAC, they were pretty happy about it. I mean, they were overall happy, but they continue. I mean, I think that the one lane roundabouts are just really, I mean, they are so much safer than other types of intersections. You cannot. You can't have rear end crashes and you can't have some smaller types of interactions. And some people are going too fast and they end up in the roundabout, like in the center of the roundabout, but you cannot, you can't have the crashes that really hurt people, right? So in one of those forums, there was a woman who, the teacher from Amherst Montessori who got hit, yes, like crossing police. the road, yes. like running red lights and like mm. T crashes and all those really serious crashes where are their fatal crashes. You could not have those at small roundabouts. 
Like right. it's like impossible. <laughs> and so, um, and so they are planning to put the rectangular rapid flashing beacons like at each of the approaches, which I think is good. And then Guilford also said, as I noted in my email, that they're also putting, they're going to have the crosswalk across the street, like to the USDA building, because people had mentioned that too, because there's the offices and apartments and mm. the gymnastics. And so that will be good to have that connection. I did ask him about what well, will people accelerate? Like what happens sometimes with roundabouts is you get out of the turn, people mm -hmm. are like zoom, like even down, yeah. people worry about that at triangle too. Right. It's like, you just wanna speed up the minute you're out of the curve. And um, mm -hmm. he said it's 300 feet. So hopefully it will still be yeah. wider. So, I mean, overall the DAC, they seem pretty happy with it. Mm -hmm. I mean, a question with the rectangular like flashing beacons is whether it will all be maintained because the DAC has done um, inventories downtown where in a lot of, like there just aren't that many that have audible signals. Like there's a whole bunch downtown that are supposed to, and yeah. some of them, they aren't maintained. And then other ones, the neighbors complain and then DPW turns mm -hmm. them down and says, I mean, it's like how you decide what's a priority and what's mm -hmm. not a priority. And My so there's some, thing, uh -huh. I, was just gonna, I used to live in Indiana, Pennsylvania when I was in grad school. And uh, their audible signal was Jimmy Stewart uh, talking because Jimmy Stewart's from Indiana, Pennsylvania. And so it was literally, it scared the bejesus out of me the first time I heard it because it goes, oh, this is Jimmy Stewart. It is now safe to cross the street. And that's the whole thing. And like, I'm not kidding. And it scared the crap out of me the first time I heard it. <laughs> oh, but sure. It was like such a fun, we should just get like, oh, this is Emily Dickinson. You may now proceed across the Oh, oh yeah, yeah, there you go. You could do. I mean, they have little controllers. No, Mindy, you don't like. That. No, no, no. It would have to be more like this. This is Emily Dickinson. The curb, walking the curb. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a curb. You're a curb. <laughs> anyway, awesome. I think we've got it. I think we've got Love it. it. Um, well, I was yeah. doing a study once. Right, there was a senior center, like right next to one of those crosswalks and i mean if you have your windows i mean it is a little annoying but we don't actually most of those downtown crosswalks don't actually have like residential properties no. right there it's, it's not like Pomeroy you're like doesn't. so it's far away that's far away i mean i'm really glad that pomeroy is fixed i mean i'm i think they need to do the project like this season right oh because God, i know that's i mean so when i finally yeah. inventoried it and i saw like how bad it it's so bad there it's <laughs> So awful, terrible. Awful there's no cross, there's no pedestrian crosswalks or anything. It's yeah. Okay. Um, I don't no. know if it's coming back before us though. That was my question because I thought the I don't think it really needs to. I don't think per it se. will. I don't think it will, but I'm glad that it's going forward. Well, and that's not really Guilford. I've asked him before because like the state DOT, they always follow the process if they have the 25% design. Then they have the 75% design. They're required to have them. And I brought up once, I was like, so what does the town do? And he's like, we don't do that. If we don't, if we don't solicit public input. Like, it's like, okay. So anyway. Um, so the one thing was that Myra Ross is still concerned that people who are experts on disability access like weren't cons consulted. And so like for example, when you like when you look at the research on roundabouts and roundabout safety, mm -hmm. like some of the travel trainers and specialists who work with like say Mass Commission for the Blind or something, they'll tell people to stay away from certain roundabouts if they don't feel like they're that safe. Mm -hmm. Particularly because the traffic is never halted a hundred percent unless mm -hmm. you have like an actual stop there. Um, and so and the one at like Triangle, the one at Kendrick Park is really bad. Like if you if you try to walk all the approaches like as like pretend that you're like an excessively mm -hmm. challenged person, it's terrible. There's the ones where you have to cross like five lanes, two islands, and make like an angled turn. Like how is that even no? <laughs> I had to run there the other day and I was like, oh my gosh, I don't know where I'm going. Um, yeah. Um, so, so is there a solution, Tracy, to that? So I mean, so she's brought it up a number of times. I mean, the rest of the committee seemed like it would be pretty good. She just wants to have confidence that it is safer. Um, so I think Maureen Pollack was gonna reach out and see there basically, there's no money to ask for a consultant at this no. point, according to mm -hmm. Guilford. And so but they were gonna see if anybody would just like evaluate it a little bit for free or something and give it their blessing. And 
but do you think someone that at John... UMass yeah someone at UMass or MS College that specializes in that? well I think you want it I mean that's there are people at UMass who've done studies on improving roundabout accessibility for visibly mm -hmm. impaired people but I think I do think it makes sense to look at like the disability like community community more just yeah, because they're I, taking it from that perspective. And I think that that's what mm -hmm. would make Myra feel comfortable. She's not going to feel comfortable like a sighted researcher. Sure. <laughs> She's like right, telling right. her, like an engineer, no less, probably, right? Is telling her what is good and what is not good. So, yeah. so, so Tracy, I think speaking generally, though, do you think that seeking opinion from DAAC is sufficient or should we be consistently building into budgets disability consultants to? Mm, I don't know. Because we rely I, on the AAC a lot and they're phenomenal, right. but they are also not necessarily always professionals in that space either. So and they aren't they aren't professionals, like they'll tell you, right? right? I mean, I think, yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. I mean, I would I mean I think that they I mean they do have staff and stuff too. And I don't I, I mean that might be a good question out? for them, but I don't do think you, you need to necessarily build it into the budget. Do you want me to find out if Mass Dot has technical assistance? They can. That would be amazing. Mm. Could you send me an email requesting that, Anna and Shalini? Just say, you know, is that does because actually that would be a good thing for Mass Dot to have is a technical assistance department on dis access and disability for. Well, so they have like mass mobility. So Rachel Fitchenbaum, who I talk with pretty regularly, so Mass Dot helped create mass mobility, um, and she does a lot of presentations around the state on improved accessibility and different programs and travel training and all those things and mass mobility was originally funded through the mass dot budget um mm. so there are some programs out there um hmm. so but yeah i mean so i think i mean it should be good i guess when they get it done but i am so mm -hmm. i am still concerned about kendrick park i mean i know there's the public hearing on that is the same night as the forum, the elementary school, because that's how meetings work. <laughs> so, oh. but I mean, I'm concerned just that Guilford had said that there's no money in the DPW budget, like to do any improvements and mm -hmm. calm any traffic near North Pleasant Street. And then it came up at the council meeting and said, well, what about, can't you do anything? Can you make it a one-way street? Can you move the parking or anything? And, and it seems, at that meeting, it seemed like Guilford's response was like, no, we can't do anything at all. But I would really, I mean, I'm seeing a lot of kids at the park and I'm mm. seeing, somebody was telling me they see families actually pull over and like drop their kids off on the park side to go park because there's not that much mm. parking in the area. Yeah. I mean, so it'd be great if there could be some commitment to do something more than nothing. I mean, until you do that, there's still going to be a cut through street and like all these other things. So even if there's not money to do big in construction improvements, mm -hmm. I would hope that there could be something for a little bit of traffic calming and safety, including moving the parking to the other side, I think. Yeah, so there must be best practices for that traffic um, calming things. Like you have a whole plan. Or... Right. Mm -hmm. like the, the whole plan was written out. The issue is that they're saying they can't fund it this year. Yeah, well, and then the no question cost. is, I guess there's also a question just about the quality, looking at the pavement conditions, like the quality of the pavement there isn't good enough to do, like, say, paint, like stripe parking meter spaces mm. or something. But on, if you look currently on the west side of the street, there's almost no markings there. I mean, people mm. park there and there's not like tons of. So I don't know. And I knew, to, I mean, I do think DPW's work plan is very full. But I think just like on behalf, I and mean, we don't know for sure that it would even be in next year's work plan, right? Because if the money is an issue, the money could be an issue next year. So it's just with all those people using the park and it is getting a lot in the playground, it is getting a lot of use, like what can be done. Okay. I don't know. Can I just quickly, something you may need to before you go, just quickly, yeah, can I, I circle know, back? Good, so. uh, because I just found the email and I'll forward it back to you. But the last discussion that happened with Paul about the, the bridge, seemed to be on August 15th, where he said that um, he sent a link to the plans and the put, uh, so the DPW put together plans and which shows the improvements we want and they won't happen for a while, we need to get the funds. 
but the engineers are working on it. How many, when did you say that was? August 15th. Oh, that was before. Okay. Uh, to me or to you, Shalini? You know that no, it was he. So he forwarded to me what he sent to you. I think. Oh no, I'm also included. So yeah, it's August 16th. Can you forward that to me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And you asked about repairing this. I have asked you to look into that, and hmm. I'll just send it back to you anyway because I think the last time, well. That wasn't my memory. My memory was it, they knew about it. It was under consideration and it was going to be done. I mean, you have to know about it, right? You drive on 116, right. it's right there. Right. Right? Not exactly a great welcome to town. So just to, again, to be to clarify, are you saying that if we send you the exact amount, you will be able to get it? Because that's the email no, I wrote I mean, if I If I had received yeah. amount of money mm. for it in February, I probably could have thought about you know right. putting an earmark for the budget that we just passed um right. there may be an infrastructure budget at some point that i get to sort of mm. have an impact on and i would submit it then um mm. right now it's probably too late i mean too late. well it's you know it's too late on the house side i guess i would need to know how much it is and maybe approach um a senator sure. say, yeah. but because I kept telling him here, Mindy's reaching out to us again and again. Why are we not giving her the numbers to get the funding? Did he say how much it would be, Shalini? Uh, let me look at the, there's a link to the plan. So I could look into the plan and see, which shows the improvements we want to make. Let me look at the plan upstairs. And I just sent you an email. Yeah, I'm sending you one right now. <laughs> um, the, but in the email that I just got from him, he doesn't indicate that it's a financial issue. He indicates it's a process issue. Yeah, it, he was just all over the place with that one, I have to say. Hey, can we turn off the recording, though? Yeah. Wait, yeah. I thought you already did. Sorry, we can edit that. Yeah, okay. you're going to 